Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you that your word is relevant in every generation. And so we ask that you would speak to us this morning, that you give us ears to hear and hearts to respond. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Isaac was not the only son of Abraham, but he was the promised son, the special one, the one who God wanted to give him. And <clears throat> Isaac has a few adventures which we can read about in Genesis. But there's not that much about him compared to what we read about Abraham. Isaac is, in many ways, a very fortunate young man. He marries the woman of his dreams. And then she bears two sons to Isaac, Esau and Jacob, twins. But not, we're told right from the start, identical twins. In fact, twins who couldn't be more different to each other. And what follows is this story that you've just heard, which probably belongs more in a soap opera than in the Bible. First of all, we have Esau, the hunter. Esau, the man's man. Can you imagine? This guy wrestles bears for fun. This guy has three shredded wheat for breakfast. This guy has a poster of Jeremy Clarkson on his tent. That's the living Bible. All right. yeah. <laughs> but it's this man who it appears is going to inherit the promises made to Abraham. And in some ways, there was no finer person to inherit. And this Esau, the hunter, is his father's favourite. There's no question. But then there's his twin brother, Jacob. Who's the exact opposite? We're told that Jacob is a quiet man. And that's not the living Bible. Okay, It's there. A quiet man. This guy is the first biblical example of a mummy's boy. For goodness sake. You know, he watches back episodes of MasterChef and Holby City <coughs> instead of going out to hunt. <coughs> but he's his mum's favourite. And his mother, Rebecca... Who has been, who was the God's gift of a wife to Isaac? Rebecca cannot bear the thought that her son Jacob, her favourite, is not going to inherit the blessings of Abraham through that line. And so she concocts, together with Jacob, the plan that you heard about to deceive Isaac to tell him a pack of lies, and to deprive Esau of the blessing that is rightly his. And you can see that this is not even a very good plan, which is why it belongs in the soap opera. You know, Jacob sees through it straight away, doesn't he? He says, look, Mum, he's going to rumble it the moment he reaches out and feels. But in the end... Jacob has not got the guts to disobey his mum. And what happens then is this story of deceit that means that the blessings of Abraham pass down to Jacob, the mummy's boy. And Isaac and Esau are just left devastated by this series of events. And the family, this is, which is God's family chosen out of all the families of the earth, becomes a divided family. It becomes what we would call today a dysfunctional family. And we're treated 
throughout Genesis 27 to a not very enlightening story. The likes of which we don't really expect to find in Scripture. Why is a story like this in Scripture? Because it tells us all the things we shouldn't do rather than the things that we should. And you might have asked yourself while this was going on, if this was so terrible, why doesn't God intervene in it? You know, why, why didn't we just read, well, and in that moment, the Lord spoke to Isaac and he said, lo, this is not your oldest son. <laughs> doesn't happen, does it? God doesn't appear. And so this story stands, a story about deceit and lies and everything we shouldn't do. And then the shocking truth that we have to get used to as the Old Testament unfolds is that the God who didn't intervene in all of this says to his people time and time and time again, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is prepared to be associated with a bunch of characters whose behaviour, as far as we can tell from Scripture, is pretty unimpressive. And whose example we shouldn't follow and who at times indulge in things which are quite disgraceful. Like Jacob in this story. Well, we have to ask ourselves what, if anything, we can possibly take away from all that. And I wonder whether the starting point is this. That there are a lot of people, and maybe some of us are like this too, people who feel that our lives have been in some way blighted by the way that things have happened. We look back at our circumstances and at the things that have happened to us in the course of our lives, perhaps at our marriages, perhaps at our families or our children, and our reflection on it is, well, these things haven't quite turned out the way we expected them to. For some people, it's a case actually of being quite ashamed of the things that have happened in the past. Because when we ask ourselves the question, well, what does God think of those things? We inevitably come to the conclusion that he's not very impressed. And I wonder if it's ever happened to you that you sort of look around at other people and at their situations and you feel a sort of slight sense of envy or jealousy. You know, wish I was them. You know, and they wouldn't have all these problems. And right from the start of the Bible, what God says to people like that and to people like you and me is take a good hard look at the family who I chose. Here's a family right from the time of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, particularly in the case of this story, which is far from being a perfect family. And yet God, throughout the Bible, is not ashamed to be associated with people like that. Because the God who we follow is a God of grace, a God of mercy, and a God of love. And when we read on, we find that other things begin to happen which are a lot more impressive God has actually got his hand on this man, Jacob. In a few chapters' time, he's going to give him a new name. The name Israel, which is the name of the entire people who are descended from him. You know? The guy who gives his name to a nation is a liar and a deceiver. Is that impressive? Well, it's a sign of how far God's grace goes, isn't it? From this family actually come all the great heroes of the Old Testament. They're all descended 
from Jacob somehow, through Jacob's 12 sons, who we encounter a bit later. Everyone who's Jewish has to look upon themselves that way. And in the end, it's from this family that Jesus Christ himself comes. It's hundreds of years, yes, but even so, this is that family. And so, we learn that the God who we follow and who we have come to know is our God. A God who knows exactly what our situations are like, exactly how we feel about it, and exactly where we stand alongside it, and who is nevertheless prepared to be associated with us and actually glad to be associated with us. And when God looks at totally unsatisfactory situations in our lives and in our families, we get this reassurance that he is with us. He hasn't kind of intervened at that point and said to us, well, you've kind of blown it, haven't you, and you really can't sort of live with me anymore. Everything that we read in the Bible tells us that that is not how God is. And that whilst he seems to be absent sometimes, sometimes he's just taking a step back from some of these situations to allow, to allow them to develop. We're told, after all, aren't we, that we live in, under a better covenant than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That if God's love was so strong and so apparent then, how much more is it towards us now? And that our God will ensure that all of this unsatisfactory stuff, which gives us so much pain sometimes, will bear fruit in his kingdom. That's the point of a story like the story of Esau and Jacob. And so, it means that we have to take a hard look at ourselves. If we feel ourselves ashamed or condemned by something that's happened in our past or even which continues into our present, then we probably need to think about repenting, don't we? This is why the New Testament says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that the condemnation that we so often inflict upon ourselves doesn't have its origin in God and therefore we can turn away from it. Now that doesn't mean that that's easy to do but it means that God is on our side as we try to do it. (laughs) For so many of us what we are in the present is dictated by the kind of past that we have. And God says no, that isn't the case. That's not what's going on. He stood by Isaac's family even after all this had happened and he will stand by us. Yes, he had an awful lot to do with Jacob. And if you're back here next week and the week after, we'll find out a little more about how he does that. He doesn't leave this guy to spend the rest of his life as a liar and a deceiver. But God wanted to do a great deal more with Jacob than Jacob could ever have been aware of in the moment when he stole Esau's blessing. God wants to do a great deal more with you and me. And the problem is often that you and I don't quite believe it because the condemnation attached to what's happened to us is still there and we haven't quite turned away from it enough. Despite what has been, we need to believe that our God is a God of love, of mercy, of forgiveness, and of grace. And that those are the things that he wants to shine out of our lives too. Can we stand, please? Can we sing? In this song, we're going to ask that uh, the Spirit of God will break out in our own lives, in the life of the church, the song Spirit Break Out. This is a, quite a simple song to pick up. Some of you may not know it. 
that, uh, <clears throat> and then Duncan's going to lead us in prayer. Thank you.